All right, so um, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, and I'll introduce our webinar tonight. So I wanna welcome everybody. Um, tonight we're gonna be talking about white supremacy and the media and the news, um, because we all know that we need a press that isn't perpetuating white supremacy. Um, so I wanna thank everybody for, for joining us and for being with us. I want to open us up with a quote by Stokely Carmichael, um, because I think it, for me, it really kind of frames a reason why we're here tonight. So Stokely Carmichael said, if a white man wants to harm me, that's his problem. If he's got the power to harm me, that's my problem. Racism is not a question of attitude. It's a question of power. Um, and that's a quote from Stokely Carmichael again. And so I'm sharing that because journalism and the media that we engage with that we use to connect and communicate. Um, it's, a, it's a space for cultural power and it's a space where people have power. It's a space where people can build power and it's a space where people can lose. Power. Um, and so whenever we're talking about journalism and media, then we always should be considering the various ways that people have power. And one of those ways is white supremacy and racism which is as old as um, the United States is and has been around, but we've been seeing new models and a resurgence of white supremacist organizing. And so gathering folks here tonight to talk about what that looks like in the news and media and what the experience of that is, um, and hopefully ways that we can imagine something different, do something different um, to create a new world. And so towards that end, one of the things that Free Press is doing um, is crowdsourcing examples of racism in the news, the racist stories that folks see. So if you all have examples or stories of that, I want to encourage you to submit those at bit.ly um, slash track racist media. So again, that's bit.ly slash track racist media. Um, and with that said, and to get us started, I will introduce myself. My name is Alicia Bell. I'll be facilitating tonight and moderating this conversation. Um, and I, I use she and they pronouns. I work at Free Press as an organizing manager. Um, and I'm going to pass it to our participants in this webinar for, to introduce themselves. So I'll pass it to you, Mike, to get us started. And if you'll just pass it to someone else, We'll go around and everyone will introduce themselves. Thanks, Alicia. Um, my name is Mike Raspoli. I'm the News Voices Director here at Free Press. Uh, News Voices is our local journalism project where we organize to build power with communities to transform local journalism. Um, I use he, he and him pronouns. And, um, you know, I think. Uh, I think the reason why I wanted to join this webinar tonight is because uh, I'm a former journalist. Um, I've seen how uh, white supremacy operates not only in news coverage, but also inside of newsrooms and how, um, and how even though newsrooms uh, make pushes for diversity, it's rarely the case that people of color actually have power inside of these rooms to make editorial decisions. Um, and um, I think that the, um, and I think that the coverage that we've been seeing recently uh, of the rise of the far right and the rise of hate groups uh, is uh, very problematic and is being normalized. And even in coverage of hate groups, we're starting to see white supremacy being centered in the story as opposed to the harm that it's creating. And so I feel very honored to be part of this panel and joined by all these amazing uh, participants tonight. And um, I'm gonna pass it to Lewis. Hi, my name is Lewis Wallace. I am a freelance journalist. Um, currently working on a book about the history of objectivity in journalism that focuses a lot on um, the ways in which the mythology of objectivity has kind of worked hand in hand with 
for white supremacy and racism um, in sort of encouraging um, and upholding lots of different forms of gatekeeping in the world of journalism. Um, so a little bit of my story of how I came to be here tonight. Um, I'm allies and comrades with the Free Press folks. And um, before I was a journalist for a long time, I did anti-racism work um, and social justice work uh, from my perspective as a white transgender person um, born and raised in the Midwest. Um, I became a journalist through a program that was designed to bring a kind of diverse cohort of community organizers into the world of public media. Worked in public media for about five years and, and through that um, got a lot of insight into the ways that uh, institutionalized racism, white supremacy were operating inside of newsrooms and the kind of um, tokenistic attitude that, that goes on there around um, discussing racism only in terms of representation um, and not in terms of power and violence uh, and various other ways that racism and white supremacy manifest. Um, and so since I left public media, um, I've been able to kind of refocus my energy on, on more of that work um, and as well as on uh, kind of working to uh, transform and, and push back against some of the kind of underlying assumptions about how we do journalism, what voices are centered, um, who is considered objective or a real journalist, and who has the authority to even tell a story or uh, talk about a thing. Um, and so pushing back on objectivity has been one of the ways that, that I do that. But I also think that some of it is, is really um, not just conceptual, but about community organizing and bringing more of those kind of uh, hard and fast tools into the world of journalism. We'll pass it to Janine. Could you introduce yourself? Uh, can, and folks can hear me, I take it. Um, my name is Janine Jackson. I am the program director at the Media Watch Group FAIR and the producer and host of FAIR's weekly syndicated radio show, Counterspin. I've been here for um, decades. <laughs> my pronouns are she and her. I'm excited to be part of this conversation because I am, I'm interested in media in a couple of ways. I'm interested and angry about the way that media constrain our political possibilities um, and the influence and power they have over our, our own understanding of ourselves and our communities. Um, I got into the work really through, I did graduate work in sociology and was very interested in corporate behavior and the sort of inability of society to uh, constrain these powerful social actors. And, um, you know, the anti-racism was just always there. But when that came together with my corporate critique and my growing understanding of the way that corporations behave within society, um, you know, that led to my 20 odd years uh, here at FAIR. Um, I'm excited to be, I'll, I'll save other things. I'll say later, but I'm very interested in the way that we are already naming uh, problems with objectivity and what we mean about diversity as opposed to real equity. And I think these are very um, exciting questions to, to get into. So I'm very happy to be here tonight. And I can hand it to Aaron if Aaron is on. Yeah, I'm on the phone. Um, thanks, Janine. Hey, everyone, I've, I've tried to get my my camera to work, but I, I think I might have to just give up on that. Um, so I hope you can hear me over the phone. Um, so I recently wrote a piece uh, for The Baffler about whiteness in media, and my goal with that piece was to, I guess, trace everything from the overt, um, uh, you know, sympathetic coverage of, of white nationalists and Senate white nationalism now uh, to the more subtle forms of you know, words and phrases like racially charged and other euphemisms um, to even, you know, things that are, you know, making historical ties between current day coverage of race and identity and uh, historical coverage, you know, at the, in the 19th century and the 20th century. And um, I discovered a lot of, you know, parallels and a lot of um, very clear through lines um, in the history of, of media coverage of race and identity 
um, similar ways that people, you know, people of color, um, other other sort of uh, other non-white people have uh, been, uh, I guess, objectified or um, shut out, whether in hiring or in appropriate coverage. Um, so that I think is, you know, the reason that I was invited to this talk. But more broadly, um, I am currently a newspaper reporter. Um, I'm actually the only person of color in my newsroom. Um, you know, I think anyone who's been in a position like this uh, can can speak at length about microaggressions and other forms of, of uh, I guess, being reminded of, of who you are and the body that you inhabit. And, you know, this is not something that I really wish, I really wish we didn't have to talk about this. And I wish I didn't have to come and speak about this and that I wish none of us were here. I wish this wasn't a thing. But unfortunately, it, it is because we're, you know, all of us are forced into this uh, and I'll wrap it up, but, you know, we're, we're all forced into this world by, you know, dominant groups, primarily, you know, white people, uh, people who invented the whole concept of race. Um, so I think it's important to be here and I'm, I'm happy to contribute to the conversation. Thanks, Anne. Um, and we can hear you, you sound great. Um, I'll pass it over to Christian. Yeah. Hello, my name is uh, Cristian Ramos, and my pronouns are he and him. And you know why I'm joining you all tonight. I, I primarily have had a, a background in politics for uh, most of my career. Recently, coming over to do more of the media advocacy work, and and part of why I did is this disturbing trend. Uh, of this administration's ability to use the media and media narratives in particular. And uh, coming from the background of politics, I was, we were always sort of very aware of the, the dog and whistle language, which is used about people of color or immigrants in particular. Uh, certainly in the past, the media has done a much better job I think of contextualizing some of this and, and really saying uh, what, is, what is occurring. Unfortunately, uh, with the rise of this administration and, and, and so much of, of the policies that they're putting out, in addition to the language being harmful, in addition to the, the destructive narratives that, that are put out there, there are real world consequences. Uh, we're currently living in, a, in an America where we're putting children in uh, cages at the border, letting them die. We are currently having to endure governments being shut down because large segments of our country believes that there's a crisis at the border. And, and the media, in perpetuating a lot of these horrific uh, narratives and stereotypes and the language they use, have not helped the situation. And so for me, uh, the reason that I wanted to participate in this call is I really wanted to sort of connect the dots between the language that's used, the narratives that are used, and the people that are perpetuating those narratives both within the administration, uh, but also within think tanks and, and the journalists that are sourcing them uncritically, right? Because at the end of the day, we want the most accurate representation of, of the policies in, in the language that is being used. So I hope to have that type of conversation. Thanks, Christian, and thank you everyone for introducing yourself. Um, we've been talking a little bit about, about white supremacy and about what that looks like in journalism and in the media. And so I, I wanna take, um, I wanna move, move back a little bit and ask if, Anyone here or, um, feels comfortable describing what white supremacy is? So knowing that everyone who's coming to this webinar is gonna be coming from different places, different political spaces and social spaces and academic spaces or not, um, I'm wondering if you can describe that. And as a person who's uh, raising children and raising four-year-olds and six-year-olds, you get bonus points if it's something that my four-year-olds can understand. Because um, I think that's important when we then we break down these terms um, that can get in the way of us building relationship and understanding one another. So is there anyone who wants to kind of take a go at describing what white supremacy is?
Uh, hey, this is uh, Janine. Um, I mean, it's, I, I guess I'd have to say it's right there in the name. You know, um, I, I think we have to be careful about defining white supremacy only as attitudes or beliefs of individuals, but we can certainly start there. It's the fallacy, first of all, that there is such a thing called race and that people who are of the white race are biologically superior to those of other races. You know, um, it has particularly been used against black people um, and also against Jews in a confusing way, but um, it's, it is essentially an emphasis on a fallacy of biological difference and, in, and the policies and programs and practices and institutions that uh, realize that fallacy, that put that fallacy out into the world. That'd be my take. Yeah, and I think building off of what Janine said and something really critical, I think, is this belief that, you know, this is something that occurs on an individual basis. Uh, you know, I think white, it's important to, I think, say that white supremacy is reflected in many structures and systems in America and um, and that there are those policies and structures are put in place to actively oppress. And in addition to the systems and, and structures, it's all, it also plays out in culture in how, um, you know, things like paternalism, um, you know, paternalism is a, is a trait of white supremacist culture. Um, often seen with the, you know, like the white savior complex or, you know, someone who maybe isn't a person of color, someone who's white, thinking that they're doing something helpful for people of color, but by acting in a paternalist nature is actively perpetuating white supremacist culture. So it's not just how we act as individuals on one-on-one -on -one basis, it kind of permeates all throughout society and culture and in the systems. Yeah, and to that end, I'm curious from you all about, um, in addition to what you were sharing in your introductions, and um, what what ways you see white supremacy showing up in journalism? And so I think there's a few different ways to look at that, right? So looking at the way it shows up in the structure and the institution of journalism, um, also the way that it shows up in the representation that you see in journalism, and then also the way that white supremacy is talked about or, or not talked about. Um, so I'm just wondering from you all, what ways you see white supremacy showing up in, in journalism? So it's so fascinating because part of it is there are journalists who are trying to cover the, the totality of a story. And, and we can take something, uh, we were talking about this earlier, like what's happening in Virginia with, with blackface. And journalists will say, well, I don't wanna use blackface 10 times in an article, so I'm gonna use some other language to describe it. But that is what it is. <laughs> and it has to be clearly explicitly stated in, in these articles such that the people understand the history of it and why it's so heinous. And similarly, Define American is currently uh, engaging in a campaign uh, to help free 21 Savage. And in the, the 24 hours after uh, 21 Savage was put into deportation proceedings, he's, he's an immigrant and he's a rapper from the UK, for those of you who haven't been following along, you had all of these criminalizing headlines about felonies and past criminal behavior, which were never corroborated, right? Nobody went and, and talked to the lawyer. Nobody checked as to whether or not any of these accusations were true. Uh, why that's so incredibly problematic, we're talking about the Washington Post. We're talking about CBS News. We're talking about NBC News. We're talking about these very mainstream journalism uh, entities. And so there has to be at some point this, this 
check on these criminalizing narratives, right, about a, a black man and, and immigrants in general, right? Like do the due diligence, be a journalist. And, and to me, that's, that's sort of the crux of the problems that, that we're dealing with right now. Hey, this is Janine. Um, I just wanted to jump in there. Uh, thank you. And also just pull back to, to remind us of a couple of sort of baseline things, which is that news media are, are never just a neutral reflection of society. You know, journalists make choices all day, every day, you know. So there are a lot of people in U.S. society who believe sincerely that the earth is flat and they vote and they pay taxes, but we don't see them reflected in news stories. Media don't spend time on them. They don't, they don't hold up a story about flying to Japan until we can hear how some folks think, you know, you're gonna fall off the planet, you know? So these are choices um, that are not just about media, but about the world we wanna live in, right? So choices about media and choices of what are represented and who is represented and how are choices about the world we wanna live in. And the other baseline thing that I think is so important to remember is that in a, in a post-apartheid society like the U.S., not being white supremacist is insufficient. Anti-racism is the work. You know, it's an undoing. Um, that's the work. It's not anti-white supremacy is work that involves seeing, seeing present day realities and history, not ignoring them. So it's not about why don't we just forget that people ever felt this way and built laws and rules and conventions and society around it. Let's forget that so that we can all get along. Let's all start from zero. We need journalists and all of us to engage in actually dismantling these ideas and the policies and practices that they create. So, you know, when I hear diversity, the way it's often spoken of in journalism to me, it sounds like a sprinkle on white supremacy ice cream, you know? It's not necessary, but it makes things prettier, you know? But as uh, my colleague Luke Harris explains, diversity in journalism or in anywhere else is not itself the goal. Diversity is a positive consequence of removing institutional barriers that still exist and rethinking conceptions of meritocracy that were formulated under apartheid. So when we talk about what we're looking for from journalists, it isn't um, simply not to give a platform to white supremacist ideas and individuals, but it's to actually engage in the work of, of taking them apart, of understanding them, of seeing where they, where they are. So you know, if we're talking about how do media give a platform to white supremacy, well, you know, you can talk about Fox News and everything, and we could talk all day about examples um, from that, but it's not just Fox News. You know, it's also, uh, as has just been said, it's these um, ostensibly mainstream, quote unquote, mainstream outlets. So we have Tom Brokaw on Meet the Press, you know, which is the chin stroking serious people conversation, you know, the Sunday chat shows, and he's saying, He's trying to be like a racist whisperer, I guess, and like differentiate himself from actual racists. He's talking about um, Republicans who were worried that Hispanics will come here and all be Democrats, and they're concerned that about race mixing. And he then goes on to say, I also happen to believe that the Hispanics should work harder at assimilation. That's one of the things I've been saying for a long time. You know, make sure that all their kids are learning to speak English, and that they feel comfortable in the communities. You know, so here we have really a kind of eminence grease of corporate news media saying basically, look, black and brown people, reasonable people like me are standing between you and the torches, you know? So just act white and stop eating that food and stop talking that language, and that's how you're gonna get along in society. Um, and that, my point in this is just that that is serious commentary. That is mainstream, pumped into every home in America, Sunday news, talk show, commentary. So it isn't just the extremists being given space to present these ideas and to argue them. It's all the folks who tell you straight up and down that they are not extremists who are, who are giving it an ear, 
you know, and when you present white supremacist views as a legitimate substantive part of the conversation, then people of color's humanity is reduced to a claim, is reduced to an assertion. You know, it's, a, it's an argument that other people can argue back against. And I think it lets liberal media feel that they then are in a position to talk about white supremacy as a kind of lamentable, you know, eternality. You know, there will be poor always type of thing. And all we really need to do is figure out a way to kind of feel better about it. So I, I guess that would be the, the main thing that I uh, want to underscore is that what we want from journalists is not ignoring white supremacy, not pretending it doesn't exist, but actually engaging it head on and engaging in the world, work of, uh, of dismantling it. Thanks, Janine. And I, I, Lewis, one of the things I've heard you talk about before is um, the relationship between objectivity and white supremacy. Um, one of the questions we asked folks participating in this webinar um, to submit questions ahead of time. And so one of the questions that was asked was, um, are fair and unbiased the same thing? And is the desire to appear unbiased causing reporters to fail as watchdogs of racism? Um, and so I'm wondering if, if you can talk a little bit about the connection between that fairness and unbiased and objective um, kind of ethos of journalism. Yeah, definitely. So I, I mean, first of all, to that question, I, I do think that the um, this sort of nebulous concept of appearing unbiased is is often being used sometimes really explicitly in newsrooms. And I've seen this um, play out, you know, it is, is often being used to um, mask an honest conversation about racism and white supremacy, or to lay a claim that it's really important that we hear from this racist or white supremacist voice in a conversation about people of color's lives. I think another way that that plays out is in um, a lot of assumptions in newsrooms just about what is a story and what stories matter, which stories are important to be told at all. Um, you know, I've worked in a number of newsrooms where the editorial board was mostly or all white. And um, a lot of the decision making that happens there is very, very subjective and is around, you know, sort of what do you think people want to hear today? Or what do you think matters to people? And so then, of course, it really matters who you think people are. And a lot of white people, when we think of a person, we're thinking of another white person, and that's white supremacy, you know, in action, playing out in these conversations in newsrooms, where then that group of people is the one deciding what's going to be leading the news today on a, you know, national or local newscast. And, um, and so many of those practices are talked about and considered as objective, and that's, that's because objectivity, you know, right now is essentially, like, it, equated with um, with the perspective of uh, white, usually in newsrooms, it's, you know, middle class or upper middle class um, cisgender male people. And there's a lot of assumptions about um, kind of playing out in those spaces about um, who our audience is and what our audience wants. Um, and so, I mean, there's, there's a, a lot that I could say about this, but my sort of argument in general has been um, that, we sh that we should stop talking about the news that we produce in terms of objectivity. Um, I think fairness can be a really useful concept. It can also fall into some of the same pitfalls around unspoken assumptions about what is fair and who are we being fair to. Um, I really, really agree with Janine that there's a certain level to which journalists need to really um, claim and acknowledge our, our positions, our subjectivities, our biases, and our values, and sort of say, okay, so I'm coming in as a white person. I have a lot of um, biases and perspectives that might incline me towards doing reporting that's racist, right? Or that's white supremacist in some way that I might not see. And so I may I may be making those mistakes in real time as I go, right? And where I'm coming from, my set of values is anti-racism and being invested in dismantling 
uh, white supremacy. And so my hope is that what that leads to is a real live conversation with the people that I'm working with, the people I'm producing news about, the people that I'm producing news for, in which I'm, ch I'm checking those biases, not necessarily setting them aside in every case, but becoming aware of what they are, and then doing the work towards a particular set of values. So, you know, as a journalist, yes, I want to transform and push back against white supremacy. And um, I'm, I'm at a point where I really strongly believe that when, um, as white journalists, we are not doing that, that we're usually upholding white supremacy um, and, and usually telling a story that um, ends up either, either implicitly or explicitly um, upholding some, some of these same ideas around whose lives matter and what stories are important that are ingrained in the culture. And so if we're not pushing back against them, we're probably participating in them. Hi, can you guys hear me? Mm -hmm. We can. Great. Um, so I think, uh, you know, going back to what was said earlier, just sort of not just not just the issue of, of what is the objectivity, but the role of journalists, white journalists, because um, I mean, I also think we need to be honest. Like when we talk about journalists and journalism, uh, unfortunately, we're talking about primarily white journalists um, because it's primarily white people who are journalists. Um, so I think, you know, to, to say that journalists aren't doing enough to uh, frame things in a way that, uh, you know, doesn't question the humanity of their, of their non-white subjects, you know, not to say that a non-white journalist couldn't make that mistake, but I think, you know, we should, we should be transparent that who we're talking about are white journalists. Um, and I also, you know, looking at sort of the historical perspective on Journalism as an institution in this country, um, you know, since its foundation, it's, it has been an organ of white America. It continues to be, um, you know, represent the voice and perspective of white America. It has never been this ideal that we're talking about now. Um, that would be something revolutionary because it's something that has never happened before. So I think, you know, myself as a professional journalist um, and having, you know, started to look into the history of of the institution as a whole. Um, I mean, I think honestly, the greater question is why should we continue to um, place value in, in journalism in general? I mean, I, I, think, I think the onus is on people who want to defend the institution of journalism to say, uh, to justify why it's an institution worth saving. Um, to be honest, I mean, I look at the massive, you know, changes going on in the industry right now, layoffs are happening. I mean, it's, it's obviously a crumbling industry. I mean, if you're a staff writer right now somewhere, um, as I am, I mean, you can kind of see the writing on the wall and um, what comes after isn't very clear. But I do also think, you know, at this time of major crises for the, for the news industry, you know, a crisis that at this point is, is like 20 years old, um, it's also an opportunity to ask, you know, if we want to continue this institution, we want to continue to maintain this institution called journalism. I think the first thing we need to do is recognize journalism has always been a white supremacist institution and to maintain it, um, to change it in a way that it fundamentally isn't white supremacist would be something that's never happened before. So, I mean, we can have something like journalism, I guess, where you're reporting on events and, uh, you know, attempting to explain material reality to people uh, for, you know, for, for purposes of, of uh, promoting equality and, and uh, um, I don't know, respect for people, whatever those values may be. But I do think that this is an opportunity in the industry right now to go back to the drawing board um, because journalism has never ever um, lived up to these ideals. Every, every um, new iteration of mass communications, uh, whether it's the penny press in the early uh, 19th century or you know, later on you had um, AP dispatches filed on uh, telegraph lines or um, you know, the radio, the internet, obviously, social media, all of it has always entrenched white supremacy and white supremacist perspectives in this country. So can this thing be fixed or should we be talking about, you know, creating something new? I don't know. But looking at the history, it just, it, it makes me, it makes me question. Oh, and by the way, my, my pronouns are he and him. Sorry, I didn't say that earlier. No problem. Yeah, I appreciate you sharing that. Um... Because what it makes me think of is how every chaos births everything, um, and and so 
I'm wondering, kind of in this journalism crisis, because you're, you've been talking about how it's been going on for a while, and um, I would even venture to say that for for Black and Brown folks um, across the United States and across the world, that there's been a journalism crisis um, for the entirety of, of journalism as an industry. Um, right. So, so I guess what I'm wondering is in this in this chaos of crisis that people are naming and talking about right now. Um, what opportunity do you all see for creating a journalism that um, that rejects and disavows white supremacy? Um, and I'm wondering what are some of the, maybe some of the values or the practices that have to be strengthened or created to create a journalism that's not in alignment with white supremacy and that doesn't create a stage for white supremacy? So I, I think part of this is just going back to some very basic tenets of journalism would, would help. And I'll give you a, an example of this. In, in what is occurring right now uh, with a lot of the media coverage on the, on the border, on immigration generally. And so you have organizations like FAIR, uh, the other FAIR, the Bad Immigration FAIR, the Federation for American Immigration Reform, CIS, Center for Immigration Studies, and um, Numbers USA, who are all part of the Tansen Network, uh, who is a eugenicist and a white supremacist. And these organizations have, have seeded narratives for 20, 20 years uh, in fringe media publications. And all of a sudden, Donald Trump becomes president, and a lot of these people in these organizations go work for the administration, start seeding sort of these eugenicist type policies and the media starts covering them. And so not only are they covering the policies, but they're also citing and talking to these organizations themselves to provide quotes about that policy. And so they're not disclosing that the policies come from these organizations. They're not disclosing that these policies have origins in eugenicism. <laughs> and they're essentially mainstreaming ideas that would have been completely outside of, of the realm of public discourse even six years ago. And so what the, you know, we're doing at Define American is we actually currently have a campaign against the Washington Post to say, hey, you guys need to correctly cite these guys or not cite them at all because they are legitimizing and mainstreaming policies which have their origins in in white supremacy and eugenicism. Yeah. Hi, this is, no, oh, sorry. No, go ahead, Janine. This is Janine, and I just want to, to maybe pick up a bit on what Aaron was saying. I fear we always emphasize, if maybe the main thing that we emphasize is that journalism may be a public service uh, and a social good, but, but media is a business and that um, it's possible to distinguish the values of journalism from those of the media that we actually have. And that is not at all to say that it is only the corporate capitalist nature of the media business that uh, makes it white supremacist. That's absolutely not the case, but it is a piece of it that I think we have to be thinking about. And particularly when we're thinking about how it could be different, and I 100% agree I think about Langston Hughes, you know, America was never America to me. And that's why I describe the United States as a society with aspirations toward democracy and not as a democracy. It, it hasn't been. It's, that's what we want to work toward. And I feel the same with media. And that's why we have to, you know, it, it, it's difficult, of course, because you have today's battles and then you have longer term battles. You have to work with media that as they exist, as we try to create these new things. So um, without letting up on the day to day, I think we do have to be talking about wholesale structural changes that, ha that change who media outlets see themselves as accountable to. And I think we see lots of experiments with that, with different sorts of funding, but it is certainly the case as if you're trying to be a journalist, a working journalist, you recognize that a lot of those models are not really sustainable uh, and that all of them have different problems. You know, you're attached to a university, you're funded by a foundation, you know, um, or you're a commercial or you're state funded. All of these 
systems have drawbacks. And so perhaps what we're looking for is a landscape of different different models that can exist. Um, but it it is a deeper than a cosmetic change. And I often talk about the, the need for representation in news media. It matters very, very much who is in the room uh, when decisions are made. I always remember because I'm um, very old, I remember the O.J. Simpson coverage and when Time Magazine had a cover of O.J. Simpson, Simpson which they, I guess, pre photoshop but they artificially darkened because they thought that added to the feeling of menace um, that Simpson, that they were trying to convey to readers. And when this, when they were called out on this and when people said, you know, this was a room of white people making this decision, right? I mean, can you just, the editor said, well, actually, um, there was a Latino guy in the room, um, but you know what, now that I think about it, I think he was down the hall uh, when we finally made that decision. You know, so it, it, it matters very, very much who gets to be a journalist, who gets to be in the room when these decisions are made, but just changing that will not be enough to make these, um, fundamental changes that we're talking about and that we desire if we're not talking about a different way of structuring media and a different um, community, different people that it's accountable to. We often hear that, you know, media are not, it's not black and white with media, it's just green, you know, they just want to make money. It's not racism, it's not white supremacists, they're just, uh, you know, they just want to make as much money as they can. And that's simply not true. Uh, and I would ask folks to to look up a piece that I wrote many years ago on discounting, and I'll just say very briefly, discounting is when advertisers, who are the lifeblood of the news media in this country, when advertisers decide that they just aren't going to pay as much to advertise on shows, radio stations or television shows, that reach a primarily non-white audience. They just say, we don't value that audience, even when Research shows that the audiences are primed and able to buy whatever product is that they're selling. And one of the things was, you know, um, Ivory Soap said that they didn't want to advertise on a Latino station because Hispanics don't bathe as often. You know, so when we get into this thing about, oh, no, it's just capitalism. You need to just say it's all capitalism. It's not all capitalism. It's racism. It's white supremacy. And it goes down into the structure of the media organizations that are dominant currently. So we can't just talk about switching out the um, personnel. We have to talk about the fundamental structure of how these uh, organizations sustain themselves. And I think what um, I think what we're seeing now is there are lots of really interesting experiments happening, especially at the local or community level, to reimagine what journalism can look like. I mean, uh, you know, our News Voices project that you know that Alicia and I work on, you know, at the heart of it, what it, what we're trying to do is get a better sense from communities what their vision is for a fair and equitable local media system um, and work with them on uh, running campaigns, developing projects, developing platforms on how to realize that vision um, and, and co-creating that with them. And I think, you know, groups like City Bureau out in Chicago uh, are, you know, are really trying to rethink what it looks like to deliver news and information to communities that uh, that better represents their needs and better represents their expertise, experience, and perspectives. Um, and I think you know, the, uh, while these local experiments maybe aren't at the moment getting at that wholesale structural change that Janine was talking about, what's exciting to me about these is that at the heart of them, it's reimagining what it means to do journalism by uh, by building up leadership and capacity in the community for people to really step into their agency and control their own stories. And, um, and I think uh, Bettina Chang from City Bureau has written about this, that, you know, the, the hoarding of, of journalist skills inside of newsrooms is one of the ways it prevents 
uh, or, or it's one of the ways that allows for them to hoard power. And I think that uh, the more that we, uh, I think the more that we move away from that closed editorial board meeting, move away from the idea that only journalists are capable of telling stories, move away from uh, media having complete control over the production of content and its distribution, uh, and the more that we try to involve other folks, then we're gonna begin moving away from this kind of hoarding of power that we have seen previously that has advanced and normalized white supremacy. I think one, sorry, someone else want to speak? Go ahead. Go ahead. I, I was just saying, I mean, I, I think thinking about um, uh, that a lot of these things are, have been recognized for a long time, you know? So I'm thinking of the Kerner Commission report, um, <clears throat> which had an explicit section that discussed media. Um, and, you know, this, you kind of have to, take it with a grain of salt because this was the way that uh, the United States government uh, essentially was, was engaging in sort of counter-revolutionary uh, potential policy. And uh, one of those was to integrate newsrooms um, explicitly through the creation of an institute uh, for, I think at the time they called it like urban reporting. So the, for those who don't know, the Kerner Commission report came out in the late 60s um, in response to uprisings by black people um, that were happening at that time. And um, one of the suggestions was uh, that media, uh, I like Janine's distinction of media and journalism. I think that's a helpful way to, to, to distinguish between the two entities. Um, but that media was you know, part, of, part of the white superstructure as it is today. And um, an explicit way to alter that would be, you know, schools specifically geared toward uh, black students um, to give them the tools to cover their communities. Um, and, you know, just despite the counter-revolutionary intent, I think, of the Kerner Commission report, I think that's something I personally, you know, find to be a, a wonderful idea and, and would love to see more of. I mean, giving people the tools to uh, articulate their material surroundings themselves um, and for the people around them I think is ultimately uh, is ultimately the goal. Um, I've really enjoyed listening to other folks talking about different innovative initiatives that are happening now. Um, obviously, you know, funding streams are always an issue. Sources of funding are, you know, always an issue. But but I do think, uh, you know, I'm not. And and maybe that's sort of the problem is like we've known for so long what what some of the solutions might be. You know, empowering people to have these tools themselves. Um, it's just the political will hasn't been there. And I guess that's something that has to change outside of the institution of journalism. Um, I don't think journalism itself is going to be the thing that, uh, you know, ends white supremacy. I'm not even sure how important it is as like a supplementary. I mean, it is sort of like plays a major role in the way that uh, people's attitudes are shaped. But at the same time, the era of mass media is is kind of over or it's like change, you know, because so many people, especially like teenagers, young people are getting news from uh, from YouTube and from, you know, user generated content. Uh, so, you know, I, I'm not I'm not sure what role journalism can play in like dismantling these structures. I don't even know how significant it can be. But I do think, um, you know, models that put tools to explain material realities and the people who who live in those material realities. Uh, should be the sh should be a goal. Yeah, and so I think it's we're we're talking about and kind of visioning what the the future of journalism can look like, um, and what a future of journalism can look like that that's dismantled white supremacy. One of the things that that makes me think of is a conversation that I was able to be a part of recently between some journalists and community members, um, and it was about affordable housing and. One of the things came up was that none of the policy um, in a city was gonna, going to create affordable housing, permanent affordable housing, um, without dismantling the power and access of white supremacy. Um, and one of the things that came up in this conversation with the journalist was that they were imagining that they would never see a day 
where the front page of the local newspaper would say, um, in order to create affordable housing, you have to dismantle white supremacy. But the thing that came up was that that's a role that, that's something that artists do in our communities all the time, that visual artists do, that musicians do, um, that performers do all the time. And so as I think about the future of journalism, I think about um, how do we balance between the role that artists play in our communities and the role that written storytellers or television journalists or radio reporters, um, balancing between the power and platforms that they all have. And so I'm, I wanna open that up to you all to ask, when you are visioning the future of journalism, um, how, what do you envision to be a part of that? And, and what work are you doing now to make sure that that vision can be realized? And I think, Mike, you were talking a little bit about News Voices earlier, um, but also wanted to open it up to other things that you all are doing to create a future of journalism that is, is not um, perpetuating or giving a platform to white supremacy. And, it, and, and to be clear, this can be um, journalism that looks a variety of ways and definitely not journalism in the way that we um, traditionally think about it. Well, one thing that I think is fascinating, uh, based off of what Aaron was talking about in, in new media and social media platforms, uh, and I don't have an answer for this, but I you know, would love to just throw this back out to the group, is these places like YouTube, um, and, and the way that they are able to disseminate information at such like an incredible rate. Um, some of these, these videos, uh, which are white supremacists, but they never use that word or term, are wildly popular. And they get into the, um, into the, uh, the next they start giving you new videos to watch and you can literally go down a rabbit hole of these these videos that are you know cheaply produced and wildly popular you know that is the uh, for lack of better words a uh, citizen journalism people just sort of spotting their views and they're very popular it, it it's weird to me or I, I don't have an answer again but this stuff is is popular it doesn't seem to be a counterweight uh, in, on, on YouTube or any of these other media platforms for this type of, you know, citizen journalism about any sort of uh, given subject. And I'd be interested to hear from others, like, why, why they think that is. In envisioning their, the future of journalism. <laughs> Yeah, I, I want to, I mean, the first example that comes to my mind actually is Black Lives Matter and the way that the Black Lives Matter movement has actually done journalism, right? And um, disseminated videos and stories and narratives um, that make the killings of Black people by police less acceptable and, and also acted as like a pressure group pushing more mainstream media in that direction. But I think in many ways, like that's an example of an organization, the Black Youth Project, other, I mean, Black Lives Matter is a movement and not just one organization, but um, the organizations associated with that movement, I think have actually used a lot of those tools, like social media tools really, really effectively and that that can be an example to journalists. Um, and, you know, one of the, uh, I know we're sort of moving away from just identifying problems and into like talking about solutions, but I think like working more closely and more collaboratively um, and working to really understand the work of groups who are doing that kind of grassroots media work is one role that journalists can take. And I work with a magazine called Scalawag that covers the South and something that we've heard from a lot of our uh, readers who are um, like a, I would say, compared to a mainstream magazine reader audience, our um, younger uh, skew LGBTQ, skew people of color, um, and, and that audience has said to, to Scalawag, um, we want to hear more stories about, um, about the work, about how um, the work against white supremacy, how the work to transform the South is actually happening. And we want to hear stories that uplift activists and that, that explain their work and not just, you know, not just take an activist and um, 
throw up a picture of that person and idealize what they do, but really dig into the nitty gritty of like, how is this happening? And, um, and I think the Black Lives Matter movement has been actually a really amazing example of kind of like media transparency, like being right there on the ground as the story is unfolding and tweeting about it and disseminating things really, really widely and then having that lead to more mainstream coverage. Um, so there's a lot to learn, you know, from them. And somebody recently just told me that um, the New York Times has never mentioned the Black Youth Project in a New York Times story. And so, you know, I think that in and of itself should be a pressure point. Like you're talking about the deaths of young Black people, but you're not talking about the young Black people who are organizing to end those deaths. Why not? Because that's a story that can really transform the whole picture, you know? Yeah, I would just um, follow up on that. I, I think that that actually is very important. Um, one of the favorite interviews that I've done recently was with um, Teresa Basilio, who had just come back from, from Puerto Rico and was talking about really making media in community and putting the infrastructure of media directly in the hands of people. I think that's the kind of the the mo uh, the critical it's both media literacy work because once you are engaged in the project of making media yourself you recognize all the choices and decisions that are made uh, and you can't watch other media in the same way again and then of course you're also creating relevant uh community level media and as has been said people are more and more looking um to other spaces to, to see themselves and to see stories they care about uh, in any event. And, I, and so I think that's um, actually really critical. Um, I think as a critic, you know, of course, I think pointing out the flaws with the system that we have now is actually positive work because it does point us in the direction of not simply thinking we're building something new when in fact we're replicating the same kind of power relationships and it's just oh we're funded by a foundation instead of by corporate advertisers you know you really have to think deeply about why what is wrong with the things as they are why it's wrong um, as we go to build these these new systems you know and it is a multi-front thing and it is a long time term battle because we have to do harm reduction in the here and now media are harming people day to day, um, really, you know, concretely harming people. And we have to stanch that bleeding at the same time as we need to be building these different kinds of structures. And I just want to say one quick thing that, that makes me mad about corporate media is the way they talk about race as a, um, first of all, as a divisive issue rather than a divisive reality. You know, and so as long as they have one person saying something and another person disagreeing with them, they think they've done their job. And the more you actually talk about life and experience and the less you talk about labels, the more you are forced to truly engage um, white supremacy and its, and its machinations in society. It's much harder than just having a kind of claims versus counterclaims. He says blackface is offensive. He says it's not, you know, um, and that's where real reporting happens. So I, I really do want to pick up on that idea of talking to expanding the notion of who is a journalist and what journalism is and where it happens, because that's, um, that's centering different people and different stories and different ideas uh, more in the direction that we're hoping to go. Um, and one of the things we're doing one of the kind of pieces of work that we're moving in at, at Free Press is um, crowdsourcing examples of, of stories that are racist or examples of racism and white supremacy um, in the media or in, in various kind of journalistic spaces to, to kind of capture those as data points and figure out how to build campaigns or projects um, based off of those. So I also want to take a moment here and remind folks who are um, on the call that if you have examples of stories of white supremacy or um, racist journalism moments, to share those at bit.ly slash track racist media. So again, that's bit.ly slash track racist media. Um, and with that, I want to, um, we are going to be wrapping up soon. And so I want to to kind of close and ask this question of um, everyone on here of, of just what is the, 
one, what are other actions that people can take um, to end white supremacy in journalism or in the news? Um, and two, what is the thing you're most excited about that's on the other side of white supremacy? Um, so again, that's one, what are actions that people can take? And two, what are you most excited about on the other side of white supremacy? Um, and I'm going to ask if everybody feels comfortable to answer that, that you do, um, and then we'll, we'll close up. Uh, well, oh, go um, just to say, uh, this is Janine, in terms of what folks can do, I think one of the things I always recommend is, first of all, you read widely um, and, and consume a variety, no matter how much you love the one outlet um, that you love, it's very important to to dip into a range of sources, including international sources, and just force yourself to get different perspectives on things because it will it will shake up your ideas of even stories that you believe that you understand. But the other thing is to look for who is left out in certain stories. We see it constantly that when, for example, there are street protests because yet another black person has been killed by law enforcement um, with no repercussion. And then media will say, black people are upset by this, you know? And no, it's not black people are upset by it. It's everybody who believes in justice, everybody who believes in our shared humanity is upset by this. But media carve us up into these different monoliths. And in doing that, they're, they're telling a lie about, um, about the way different ideas move through society. You know, they're making it uh, a thing where it's a zero sum game and equity therefore means taking from some people to give to others. Um, and that therefore, if you just love your own people, then, you know, that's, that, um, that somehow, you know, that's not doing wrong. And I think that conflation, that invisibilizing people from issues where they matter, like white anti-racists is one of the biggest harms that media do. And so, putting in the effort to see around that, to see who is not, what voice is not in this story, what perspective is not in this segment, is proactive work that we can bring to all of the media uh, that we consume, whether or not we think it's good, bad, or indifferent. What I'm most excited about on the other side is, <laughs> golly, is the, the, is the joy, you know, is just the actual happiness and enjoyment um, that I think will be possible when we are actually in a place where we can see that we are all equally human and that we then can see that inequity is inequity and not difference. I think everything will fall out differently. It's like putting on a new set of glasses. You know, things will look different and feel different when we change the lens um, that, that we're looking through. And I'm, I'm excited about the real world implications of that of that joy, of that opening. Um, and I don't think, you know, is it tomorrow? No, but I, I got to get out of bed tomorrow. So I have to keep it, I have, you know, we keep our eyes on the prize and we do the work that we have to do day to day to move us toward it. Thanks, Janine. Um, on the other side of white supremacy, uh, I'm excited about, like the stories, that was the first thing that came to my mind, the, the room and expansiveness for the stories um, that people of color will be telling um, when like not boxed into the corner of responding to racism or anticipating the racist response to those stories before being able to tell them. Um, and then uh, the black folks, I think the thing I'm most excited about is like the um, pursuit of spiritual wholeness um, as, as white people that um, isn't accessible when we're continuing to uphold and benefit from a white supremacist system. Um, in terms of things that we can do, um, I, I'm really into like for, for people who are coming, who are here, who are coming from the perspective of an audience, um, I think it's really important to put pressure on the media outlets that you do, you know, listen to, watch, subscribe to, participate in. Um, 
you know, put individual pressure, write letters, um, join campaigns. I follow and I would recommend that everybody follow colorofchange.org, which really, really frequently runs campaigns um, calling out specific forms of uh, anti-blackness and white supremacy in media. Um, and they've done a lot of great work with that over the years. Um, but also like don't don't underestimate your um, power individually or collectively as as an audience member. Um, I worked for years in public radio and I know in local public radio that a phone call, you know, criticizing, complaining about something, asking for less of this or more than that is a really meaningful thing actually to do. And so, um, so you know, that's your radio station. And if you're sick of the racism on that radio station, like call them and let them know because um, they may or may not be responsive in that moment, but it does make a difference. And then I think on the journalism side, for journal for folks on here who are journalists, I mean, there's a million things that we can be doing. I think the one of the ones that comes to mind in the context of this for me as a white journalist is just constantly acknowledging my own subjectivity and opening myself up to criticism and feedback and transformation and you know being on the receiving end of that um, of that criticism and being actually willing to to change and to listen and you know listening is such a fundamental tenet of being a journalist um, but it's also easy to slip into sort of not <laughs> into not listening and I think um, there are, have been some really really harmful consequences of of journalists not listening to um, the stories about white supremacy that are already there and and have been um, coming from communities of color you know around the country and so just um just listening opening ourselves up acknowledging our own subjectivity and and really um as much as possible, and I, I mean this especially for uh, for other white journalists, taking risks, you know, white, white people can afford to take more risks um, in a lot of cases, are less likely to lose our jobs for standing up for something, and journalists of color are constantly being pushed out of the industry, so um, I'm taking what risks are, uh, are possible um, to really push back from inside, I think is, is really a part of the work that I want to see more and more white folks specifically stepping up to doing. I think that's a really great point, just like pressure points that people can do, either journalists inside of the industry or outside of the industry, um, just to sort of like uh, put it back to historical perspective, in the 60s and the 70s, um, a big component of, of the civil rights movement uh, was to challenge the broadcast licenses of um, radio stations and uh, broadcast news networks uh, that, you know, even if they didn't do something overtly racist, you know, if, if, if it was that they were not covering, you know, topics that were important to people of color in their communities, people would actually challenge their uh, their broadcast licenses with the um, FCC. Um, so I don't, and I don't, you know, I, I think a lot of those those uh, forms of, of redress for, were gutted in, in subsequent decades, unfortunately. Um, but I do, you know, reading that kind of gave me a light bulb moment where I thought, you know, what, what sort of uh, redress is there still um, for people, you know, rather than, I, I feel like we're all so conditioned to sort of like react on social media um, I know that I certainly am, and I really try to be mindful of, of, you know, what that says about my own political power. I mean, you know, by reacting on social media and, and letting it sort of, you know, really affect my, my mood or my, my process of thinking, I think it's also kind of an acknowledgement of my lack of political power at, at an injustice. Um, so I would just, you know, I think it's worth people thinking about, you know, what regulatory tools there actually are to correct these things. And if anything, it'll just make um it'll just make life harder for these racist news organizations so why not let's do it and then i think you know another another point is um for journalists who are uh working for news organizations um this is specifically for journalists of color um you know i'm sure if you're you know if you are a journalist of color working in a, in a, in a white newsroom you are going to be experiencing uh microaggressions more often than not um, I think it's it, it's probably less likely that you won't. Um, so I think, you know, these things do rise to the level of you can file a complaint with uh, the EEOC, the uh, Equal Employment um, Opportunity Commission, I think 
is what it stands for. Um, so there are like those tools available. And I think the, I don't know what the state of that, of that federal office is, you know, especially under a white supremacist um, administration. But I do think that uh, it's worth exploring those tools. And I mean, if, if you experience um, microaggressions or overt racism in the newsroom by your colleagues, uh, it, it, it's really scary, you know, to be the only non-white, uh, you know, person in a, in a white newsroom. Uh, it's, it's scary to um, create ripples. Um, it's scary to stand up for yourself because you're going to be gaslighted by these people. Um, but we have to do it. I mean, you know, if, if people aren't going to do it, um, if people of color are not going to call out the racism that they experience in the newsroom, um, I don't know, it's, it's going to, to keep happening. And it, it sucks, you know, for, for journalists of color to have to have that burden of not just enduring the racism, but also having to call it out and, you know, endure the professional repercussions of maybe you can't, you know, put this person down as a reference, even though your work was really good there. Um, but, you know, it's just, I, I, I feel strongly that you have to, you have to call it out. And then what am I looking for on the other side of white supremacy? I mean, I don't know, just everything, you know, a world without hierarchy or, or, uh, you know, masters, um, you know, just a different sort of society that I think has, you know, ever existed in the United States. I mean, the United States was, was explicitly founded as a white supremacist country. So I do think we have to ask, like, if we are going to live in a post-white supremacist society, I don't know, that might be kind of like a post-American society by proxy. You know, some people might say, oh, no, it's actually a, a, a better realization of American values, you know, once we get past white supremacy. I'm not really convinced by that. I think Americanism and white supremacy are inextricably, inextricably linked. Um, I'm open to, you know, hearing other arguments, but I do, I just, I really look forward to um, a lack of hierarchy, um, you know, actual, just, just, you know, just, just fundamental respect for, for another life. And, and uh, I, don't, I, I almost feel corny, you know, with some of the words that are coming to my mind, but really it's just the abolition of hierarchy. You know, race is, is, is one of those, um, but obviously there's, there's many forms of hierarchy in the society and the idea of abolishing all of it is just, uh, you know, it sounds wonderful. About you, Christiana or Mike, what are y'all thinking about? Yeah, so I think I'm going to do a two for one here. <laughs> I am really looking forward to uh, the media ad advocacy uh, part of all of this, which is right now, Define American is uh, engaged in a campaign, Sources Matter. I referenced it before. And, and really, this is something that anybody can participate on social media on, you know, tweeting out uh, at journalists when they're quoting anti-immigrant hate groups or hate groups or using language that is dehumanizing. Uh, people, I, I think, don't really realize how much power they have in these moments when they see dehumanizing language, when they see sources being incorrectly uh, cited. And it really is as simple as getting on Twitter, figuring out what the journalist's um, uh, handle is and, and tweeting at them. And that's sort of, 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 of the vein of which we hope people participate in this campaign. You can go to sourcesmatter.com to sort of see our argument. Right now our big target is the Washington Post who surprisingly is, is, is not great about this uh and participate there that would uh bring me great joy yeah i mean i think i think what we can do is organize and mobilize um you know i think i think for for a long time people who weren't inside of newsrooms have been called the audience or they've been called consumers and we've been conditioned to think that somehow our actions can't actually change the media. And I don't, I don't think that that's true. We, we have lots of examples of that not being true. Obviously, Define Americans campaign, uh, looking at color of change, like, like Lewis mentioned, the Center for Media Justice, organizations like Free Press. Um, people are, uh, when people organize and mobilize to change media, you begin to see results. 
Um, and we need to be doing that at the structural level to be, uh, to be preventing further media consolidation and corporate ownership and the silencing of independent media voices. And we need to be doing it at the local level like Alicia's doing in North Carolina uh, by working with community members to really transform the way that they interact with their local media outlets so they, they can participate more in the news gathering process. Um, there are things that we can be doing uh, in our own community to, to really change what local journalism looks like. And I think that the more that we step into our power, uh, that we can begin to really dismantle a white supremacist media system, both at the grassroots level and at the structural level. We just need to be able to uh, to have confidence that through organ through organizing and through mobilizing, that that's actually something that we can achieve. And I feel like what I'm looking forward to on the other side of white supremacy is just um, is that feeling of joy. Uh, and wholeness that many other people mentioned because um, you know like as as a as a white person like i i don 't feel whole or joy uh, with the current system that 's in place and i don 't and i don 't think that often uh, white people talk about how harmful uh, this this is or how much it affects our friends our neighbors. And so, um, so I'm looking forward to feeling more whole and feeling more joy on the other side of white supremacy. Thanks, y'all. Um, there's a lot of a lot of dreams that um, haven't been realized and haven't been manifested um, that'll be realized on the other side of white supremacy. Um, especially the dreams and visions and, and projects and excitements of um, black and brown folks and indigenous folks across the world. Um, I'm super excited about that. And so I, I know that Janine said it might not happen tomorrow, but it might. Um, and there are ways that we can kind of create these small examples of, of um, liberation and freedom and a, a society without white supremacy um, in our work now and in our world now. And I come from ancestors who were Maroons and started Maroon societies. So I, I know the power of um, creating small communities of freedom and how that can inspire and shift entire societies. Um, so on that, I want to thank everyone for participating tonight. Um, and thank everyone who was listening and thank everyone who submitted questions beforehand that we were able to incorporate tonight. Um, and a thank you to all the panelists and all of the people behind the scenes, um, Lucia, who helped um, send out emails for this and all the folks who did tech work in the background. Um, because it, it takes all of these levels to make something happen and not just the people who are visible and at the front. So thank you all, and thanks to everyone else who can't be seen right now. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Good night, y'all. Good night. Good night.